So I think we could start. We have quite a few people now. So uh, my name is Lori Hurdle. I'm one of the uh, SHORE team members. And again, just to remind everybody that this is a recorded session uh, to leave your cameras and yourself on mute. Um, there will be a question and answer period towards the end of the session. So if you have anything that you would like to ask that came up during the presentation, please go ahead and write it in the chat uh, section. And then uh, we will answer those questions at the end of the uh, presentation. All right. And if you're a professor or uh, administrative staff member, if you do have questions, if you could just let us know by self-identifying that you are a staff member, because the answer to your question will be uh, different than that of the student. And I'll let Diala take over. Sorry, Lori, you were cutting out for me, so I can't hear you. You can go ahead. It's okay, all yours. Perfect. Thank you. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the SURE 2021 uh, presentation. I will be uh, giving you an overview of the SURE program. And as Lori mentioned, the session will be followed by Q&A period, so you can ask your questions also to introduce some of um, my shorts. Uh, Brie, who will be speaking to you about the summer activities for the short. And Lorraine, who will be speaking to you about great opportunity that is available for students. We also have Daniel, a McGill mechanical engineering student, who will be speaking to you about his short 2020 experience. And he will also be available for the question and answer period at the end of this presentation. So as I mentioned in this presentation, we'll be giving you an overview of the SURE experience. Uh, we will have Daniel here to give us his testimonial about his SURE 2020 experience, as well as um, an explanation about the application process, eligibility, and the procedure uh, for uh, the short program. And then uh, we uh, will let you ask your questions at the end of this presentation. So the Summer Undergraduate Research and Engineering Program offers summer research traineeships. Approximately 125 short students are accepted to this competitive program where they get to work closely with a McGill engineering professor on one of their research projects for 16 weeks in the summer. Uh, this is a great opportunity for undergraduate students to get an insight into the graduate student experience at McGill and to also have exposure to the research experience and to learn more about careers in research. The traineeships, sorry, the traineeships are funded through the Faculty of Engineering and they are available to all eligible McGill undergraduate students, irrespective of their citizenship and immigration status, and to a limited number of students who are external to McGill, both Canadian and international students. Last December, which is the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, announced an increase to the value of undergraduate student research awards. So starting this summer, 2021, the value of NSERC portion of the USRA will be increased from $4,500 to $6,000. The 25% minimum contribution of $1,000 from the university will continue meaning that the award will have a minimum value of $7,500 for students. However, for non-USRA students, they will be receiving a total of $6,000 as listed in this table. And to be eligible for NSERC, student must be a Canadian or a permanent resident of Canada. This means to explain more students um, receiving USRA will receive $7,500 and non-USRA students will receive $6,000. Um, the amount, which is the faculty contribution of $3,000, this is a fixed amount, 
um, whereas the amount of this um, contribution from the supervisor, that's a minimum account um, amount. So we encourage students to negotiate the stipend or this award with the professor. Um, so um, we've given this amount as a minimum, but we encourage you to negotiate this amount with the professor. So if you don't know how to do that, I advise you to meet your advisor, someone like my colleague Lorraine, who will be also part of this presentation and who can go over with you uh, to um, show you how you can negotiate, um, like negotiating a salary with a future employer, but this time you're gonna be negotiating this award with a professor. For students who do not receive USRA, the total award would be 6,000, as I mentioned. And this is an increase from last year, which was 5,625. So you might be thinking, uh, am I going to be um, given USRA or am I going to be given the shore? So once all positions have been matched, the list of candidates and we verify who qualifies for NSERC and who qualifies for shore. The key thing here for the selection process is for students. So uh, NSERC students in citizenship or permanent residence and have higher uh, CGPA will be selected for this uh, award and the rest of the students will receive will re award. So now I will pass the speech to Daniel who will be speaking to you about his short experience for 2020. Daniel? Great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so as was mentioned, I uh, was one of the students that, uh, that participated in SURE 2020, so this past summer. Uh, I also actually attended the SURE program in, uh, I believe, 2017. Um, so that was my actually second year, and I'm currently a master's student in mechanical engineering under Professor Forbes's lab, uh, which focuses largely on, on robotics and um, state estimation and, and controls and, and so on. Um, so yeah, just to talk a little bit about my, my two experiences. Uh, in 2017, I actually worked in Professor Cooperstock's lab. I worked on a pair of haptic shoes, which uh, were kind of cool. Um, it was essentially shoes with integrated electronics in them. Uh, so I was developing application platforms. I actually ended up coding up some apps, even though I was a mechanical engineering student. So that was a pretty great experience to uh, actually try out, you know, a slightly different field of engineering, um, which, which I quite enjoyed. And then for this past summer, you can kind of see my poster on, on the screen. Uh, I worked with a little bit more of uh, machine learning and uh, state estimation. So this time I worked actually with Professor Forbes, uh, who, who's my current supervisor. So that was a really great experience to kind of get a jump start on, on being a graduate student. Um, and so, yeah, so my research essentially uh, revolved around applying this uh, Gaussian process, machine learning process, um, to a state estimation problem, which essentially just means trying to figure out where the robot is in the room using the minimal number of sensors possible. Um, so I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed both of these experiences. Um, I think they, again, now that I'm in grad school, I think they're actually a very, very great insight into what grad school looks like and in what, into what academic life looks like. Um, and I think it's, it's a great way really to figure out whether grad school is something that you're interested in or not. So I would say kind of my experience uh, led me to, you know, be more interested in grad school, but I know some, some of my friends have attended the program and kind of made up their mind the other way. So I think it's a great way to, to figure out what you want to do with, uh, with that regard. Um, I also think it's just a, a, a quite a great way to, um, you know, experience all of this without having too, too much pressure on you. So typically I think professors uh, scope the problem quite well. And so you're not too overwhelmed. Um, yeah, and I guess just some last uh, pieces of advice. I would strongly recommend that you actually go and talk to the professors that you're interested in working with, um, just to figure out if, you know, if the project is really what you want to do. I, I think it's quite important to be working on something that you're interested in and not just something that kind of sounds cool. Um, so just make sure that you double check, you know, are they working on hardware or software? 
Are you going to be working with, you know, maybe developing theoretical models or a lot more hands-on stuff? And depending on which one sounds more interesting to you, uh, I would kind of suggest you, you try and pursue that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be here uh, for questions now and, and later on. And uh, yeah, hey, hope you, know, you guys. Um, explain to us what we're looking at right now, what this, this graph is. <laughs> the, you mean the poster? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so <laughs> so you can kind of see in the bottom left, uh, essentially what, what the premise of the research was um, is, as I mentioned, to get rid of some of the sensors that are traditionally needed in order to figure out where a robot is in a room. Uh, so this was specifically for indoor robotics. And so you would have these kind of like five anchors, which would send out um, essentially like range measurement or signals, which you can use to, to measure range between the sensor and the robot. And based off of that, uh, we actually figured out that we could use the uh, received signal strength, which is essentially just like how strong the signal is that you're receiving from an anchor, uh, that you could actually use this received signal strength to predict the orientation of the robot, um, which previously the received signal strength wasn't really used for anything. Um, and so we, we use this in combination with, again, this machine learning tool to essentially train it to figure out, okay, if my received signal strength from each of these anchors is this, and my range measurement is this, what is my orientation um, as well as my position? So previously you could only really predict the position, but then with this machine learning tool, uh, we actually managed to predict the, the orientation. And that's what these graphs are. You can kind of see in, in the, the black dots are the, the true values um, in that middle graph, and then the colored dots are the predicted values. So you can see that it kind of follows the trajectory quite well. Thanks. And Brie will talk about what you'll be doing as a, you know, the students that are listening in, she'll be talking about this uh, part a little bit later, which is why I wanted Danil to, to kind of give a brief uh, <laughs> uh, intro as to what this is. Thanks, mm -hmm. Danil. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. So for project abstracts, they are now posted. Uh, they're listed on our SURE website via this link. And you can go to the link and view the projects available for you that are listed by department. So you can look at those now, they're posted. For eligibility, if you're asking, am I eligible for SURE? ASTER is considered to be a scholarship and award. Students must be full-time students with CGPA of 3.0 or higher to be considered for the SURE award or SURE. At least in year one, participants are expected also to be available for the summer uh, for 16 weeks period, May and August. For non-McGill students, if you are selected for SURE, uh, you will be expected to obtain appropriate visa documents, insurance, and all this information will be found on the Citizenship and Immigration Canada website. So I encourage you to uh, consult with the website and see what are the paperwork required for you as a non-McGill student or um, a non-Canadian. The participation in the short program will be recorded on the student's transcript. Um, Sorry about that. I just wanted to add in Diala for the full-time status. The only exception is for students if let's say you're in your graduating semester. Uh, so let's say this month or sorry, this term is your last semester, then you could potentially be a part-time student. We'll evaluate your record and see where you are. Um, but that's the only exception to the full-time status. And sorry for changing the slide. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. Okay. okay. So for the application process, abstracts and online student application are now available, as I mentioned. So first step for you would be to carefully check the projects, uh, go to each project, uh, look at the information, what is required of you, uh, contact the professor via email to discuss the project, what is expected of students to apply to this project, and you can also ask your questions if you have any. After the discussion with the professor, uh, you can complete the application form, submit it along with your transcript, and um, send it via email to the selected supervisor. 
in some inst instances where um, a professor and student come to an agreement and wish to work together on one project, uh, we encourage if this agreement is in place that you apply to only one project and in this case, the professor would be ranking only one student. This is important notes to keep in mind. So each student is allowed up to three applications. The deadline to apply is uh, January 22nd, um, meaning submitting a copy of your online application with your transcript via email to your professor. So make sure you approach the professor as soon as possible if you're interested, ask your questions, submit your application via email. And um, so you don't miss the deadline. Decisions will be announced the week of February 22nd and we will contact the students who will be selected. There will be a second round to match students in March. Um, so uh, usually uh, you'll be contacted in March if a second round is happening. Can you just want to talk about the saving the files or printing to PDF? Yes. Just as a reminder, so, please. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lori. So the application itself uh, is, let me go if it's in the second slide. Yeah. So this is the application form. This is what it looks like. Sorry. Okay. So you can access this application via our website. So basically it has your general uh, personal information, the SURE project that you're applying for, and then um, it would be, uh, you can print this document and we encourage you to print it where you can save it. So you can print and then save it as PDF and then you can email it to the professor. So make sure you do that so you can have a copy of your um, application. Sorry, if, um, and if you've forgotten to print this PDF or if you have any issues, you will receive an automated email. You'll have to use that and forward it to the professor instead. Okay, and then also to it, just from a question that came up in the inbox this morning, it's one application per project. So you can't select three projects in the same form. You will have to, if you choose to apply to three different professors, uh, you will, or three different projects, you will have to fill in a form for each one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the short positions are full-time positions. So you are required to be dedicated to the research program for sure for 16 weeks. Um, and you should not be registered for any courses in the summer. However, if you have any extenuating circumstances, you have a special circumstance or you have a job and it, or, or an evening job, you can um, communicate this information to the professor and see if this is possible that you can do both. And as well as letting us know uh, by emailing um, email address, sure-info.engineering.mcgill.ca. So make sure you do that before applying to the project to see if this is feasible or not. Um, I'm going to be, I think that there's something that I forgot to mention. This, uh, the SURE uh, experience or the program would be reflected on your transcript. So we have uh, designated uh, courses um, for, for this purpose. So it will be recorded on your transcript. So you have um, an official record for your uh, sure experience on your transcript. And now I'll pass uh, the speech to Brie, who will be speaking to you about sure events and vacations. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brie. Uh, I work as one of the advisors in MESC uh, and I work a lot with grad students as well in our faculty. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what else is part of the SURE program and a little bit about our MUSMA uh, program. So part of, of SURE, we have four different events. Um, so usually these events are in-person events um, and they will help you get a bit of a feeling of that you're all together working on the same uh, project, um, learning a little bit more about um, how to design a poster and also eventually that's also the end goal of your um, short project is that you have to present your poster. Um, uh, we have set up a few tentative dates 
Obviously, we have no idea right now if our uh, events will be happening in person or online. Um, so you will be receiving information as soon as we know how to plan. Um, but the idea is that we, that we will have to be present at uh, four different um, uh, pro, like four different events. I was wondering, can I? So again, you are um, required to attend all the events. Um, if you cannot if, uh, attend for any reason, um, uh, please let us know. Um, I mean, there can always something can always happen. You can always get sick. Um, can I go back to the, the previous slide, please? Sorry, I can't grant you access, uh, Brie, oh, okay. so I'll have to do it for you. Um, so if you're, so it's not the idea that you go on a six week holiday during your obviously 16 week um, uh, shore project. However, if you do need to have a, a week vacation, um, please feel free to discuss this with your supervisor before you are starting the project. I think it needs to be very clear that before you start the project that you're planning on taking um, a bit of a leave or vacation um, and you have to also make up the time and I, I've, I've seen one question the idea is that you work 35 hours a week not 35 hours over the whole period but it's 35 hours a week so a regular uh, work week okay let's go to the next slide um, I think the Neil also mentioned this um, that the sure event can be or the sure can, can be as a very good experience to understand a little bit about what it is to do research. So if after um, doing your sure project, you, you are set on, um, on pursuing your graduate education or your graduate degree, uh, we have uh, a scholarship that, that could help you with this. Um, it is called the MUSMA program. This program is, um, is a $17,500 $17,500 um, scholarship um, that, will, um, that will be awarded to you if you meet certain, um, um, if you meet certain qualifications or you have to have a CGPA of 3.5, you have to participate, have participated in SURE or other research experience in McGill. Um, and there are also a few other ones, for example, that you, uh, that you have to compete with other students in your departments. Um, so if you're interested in participating in MUSMA, if you, um, if you are in contact with the professor, please also reach out to your departmental coordinators to ask them how you can be nominated for, for a MUSMA program. That's the next slide. Okay, so I think I'm going to give back the, so if you have any questions about grad school, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or ask any of the questions in, um, in, in, the, in the chat box and we will try to respond to them. Thank you, Breeze. Um, so Shore International, um, this is students who have secured a summer research internship abroad can apply for Shore International Travel Stipend, which is funded by the faculty's generous donors, as well as McGill University in support with undergraduate student research abroad. Students who are selected for this travel stipend will receive one of these awards that are listed here. So a GRAP Award, International Shore Award, a Shouyang International Experience, uh, and Enhanced Educational Opportunities Funding. As far as we know, this is going forward unless travel restrictions are still active and are extended for the summer. Uh, but so far, we, um, we are uh, going forward with this. So if you have um, a summer research program abroad that we'd like you to participate in, applications are available for March. So between March 1st to March 31st. So you can apply and the link is available and also more information is available on our website uh, for more information about the, the, uh, the, the organizations that are funding um, the Shore International. Can we just add in that if the pandemic does continue and travel is still restricted, if you happen to uh, be living in another country and get a job there, you could potentially uh, qualify for this. But you have to already be in that country where you get the international internship. Yeah, so this is, as an, this is an exception that was given to us this year, taking into consideration the pandemic. So if you are, as Lori mentioned, if you are, for example, in France, you have an opportunity there, you're a McGill student, you can still apply for the International Short Travel Stipend. 
Okay. Um, next, uh, Lorraine. Um, Lorraine will be speaking to you about Global Challenges Award. Hi, thank you. Um, the Global Challenges Award is a new award. We tried to launch this last year, but due to the pandemic, we had to um, we had to put that aside for the year. So we are relaunching it. It's actually bigger and better this year. Um, the idea here is that we are providing a stipend or an award for a student who is doing an engineering related project that would otherwise not uh, be paid. Okay, so this is uh, maybe as an engineering student, you're involved in your community um, and there's, there's a way for you to, to bring your engineering skills to a project. Maybe if you're a software developer and there's a, a local food bank who needs some help, uh, perhaps it's setting up a website, perhaps it's setting up a database. Um, if you and a partner can come up with some sort of project, we are offering to fund up to uh, $10,000 for the summer for you to, to be able to go forward with this project. This type of award is not for, uh, not to supplement an internship. It's not to supplement your shore stipend. It's really something um, on the side. So it, it's, it's new, it's ambitious. The idea is that you would work with um, a not-for-profit or um, socially minded uh, enterprise in your community. We are looking for something that can be 12 to 16 weeks long, something that can be mentored by a professional of some sort. Um, hopefully you can provide us with some learning outcomes and deliverables and uh, there's an application that opens up on January 25th. You can take a look at the website below. There's a lot more uh, information there. And also given the pandemic, if uh, as it stands now, we're not certain about summer, similar to the Shore International. Um, if you have to travel for this opportunity, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to, to fund that given where we are in the pandemic come come the month of May. So I encourage you to, to think about this. Maybe you're already working with a nonprofit, um, or maybe this will give you a chance to finally work on some kind of passion project. Um, you're welcome to find me um, online and book an appointment via the Engineering Career Center, or you'll find my contact information as well on the Empower website. So. Take a look. Uh, don't be shy to ask questions. I'm really looking forward to reviewing your projects. Thanks. Thank you, Lorraine. So um, now it's time for your questions. Uh, I can see that Bree is already uh, answering some of the questions in the chats. Um, even though you have questions after this presentation, you may email us, but we're going to read your question in, in the chat and answer them. To notice that some students are raising their hands so you have to put the questions in the chat please um i think one of the question is is that uh, what happens when a professor does not respond to my um what if i inquire and the professor is not responding to me like can i still submit applications um i would uh, what i would suggest is that you give the, the, the professor time to respond uh, of course, you, you shouldn't miss your deadline to apply. So you can reach out to us if the, the, the professor did not respond. However, I guess, you know, you have to communicate with the professor before applying. Am I correct, uh, Lori? Yeah, so um, I would suggest as well, uh, it depends on when you would, you know, if you only reached out to them yesterday, give them a couple of days. If it's, you know, you emailed them, let's say on Monday, uh, for example, then, Hopefully they'll get back to you by the end of this week. If not, you can reach out to somebody in the department. Uh, you can always ask us who it is by emailing the short inbox and we can let you know who the contact is because they can let you know or let us know what's going on. Um, but yeah, ultimately it has to be through the, through the professor. Um, I then I have another question from Anik and he's wondering, so 
uh, when you are a student from outside of McGill, um, can I, like, do I have to submit my official transcript or can that also be a grade sheet of each, each semester? And another question is, do I have to calculate by GPA out of 4.0 or will we be able to use um, your, like the, their own uh, grading scheme? First of Not all, convert it to our 4.0. Yeah. Yeah, that's regarding the GPA. And as a non, since you are a non, um, you are required to submit an official um, transcript. It might be a requirement by the professor. Uh, so that's why we say it's best to communicate with the professor before and see what the requirements are. Because I know at McGill, you can now get uh, like a PDF of your official transcripts. I'm assuming that a majority of universities have something similar. If for whatever reason yours does not have that option, then you can let the professor know and you can just download an unofficial copy presently. But if you do get hired, then we will need the, uh, we will need the official uh, transcript later on to confirm grades. Okay, and then... Um... So I think as mentioned before, someone is asking about summer courses or, or having the possibility. I think usually you're, you're not allowed or we are asking you not to take any summer courses. Um, and then I think Lindsay is asking, uh, can I be full-time in winter 2021 and then and fall part 2021, but part-time in winter 2022 to apply? I, so she's wondering like, when, like what is the specific of, of being full-time, I think? What are we looking for when we are asking students to be full time? I think I think the students should be full time for fall and winter. For Before they're taking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The Before. only exception is if you are graduating, like in your graduating semester, you are a part time student and that's fine. But otherwise, this is supposed to be a full time program. So every semester you should ideally be I registered as a full-time student. Yeah. And what was the okay, other I'm question? Looking at what's coming after, in this case, the students is asking for winter 2022. We're not looking at that. We've been, we are looking at what you are currently in. Uh, so if you've been full-time for the past term and this term, um, you're eligible to apply. Yeah. Part-time next year uh, in one of the two semesters, and then you try to apply for sure in 2022, then you might not be able to do that. Yes. We'll have to reassess at that time. Uh, so there's a question is, will having an SU class uh, affect if we are accepted to this year program? So is an SU course, is, could, is it a problem if I have an SU course on my transcript? Basically, it is not a problem. However, some professors might be looking uh, as a requirement that you have done a certain course. Um, so, um, and they would like to know you've done that course. If this course is an is assumed, then you might be um, uh, the, the the professor might want to know how much uh, did you get on this uh, course, as it is um, uh, an important component for you to apply to that project. So basically, the the general rule is there's no problem, and requirement by the professor that you you should have a certain grade in a certain course. I always use a machine tool lab as a, as my sample, you know, my example that if you're a mechanical student trying to apply for a, you know, mechanical project, then they may want you to have completed and gotten a, a good grade in machine tool lab. And so marking a course as SU doesn't really give them a sense of how well you did. And that could mean whether or not they hire you. Uh, so just that's something to think about. It doesn't affect your actual application like Diala says, but a professor may want to see an actual letter grade in a particular course. Uh, you know, it's one thing if the professors maybe at the beginning of the research, not so bad, but if they're two or three years into whatever it is that they're doing research on, they most likely will want somebody who has uh, good grades with great experience. And I, I just remember what the other question was uh, that we kind of uh, skipped over quickly. So if let's say you want to take a course in the summer, but you can make an arrangement with the professor that you work nine to five, but you're taking a continuing education course from six to nine, as long as it doesn't affect your work hours then that's fine. Or you could do the reverse. If let's say you have a class from 8.30 to 10, you can ask your prof to do um, like a shift from 11 to 6, Monday to Friday. So there is a little bit of flexibility in there, uh, but we will be verifying. And if you are taking a summer course, uh, you will most likely get an email from us questioning, uh, did you get approval? And we need approval from the prof. So it's not a full no, but 
you're supposed to be doing research. That's the, the intent of the program is to do summer research, not research and classes. It is a full time, um, let's call it a job like, like that, you know, it's something where you are expected to work a minimum of 35 to 40 hours a week. Um, so we have a lot of questions I see about U0, U1, U3. Um, am I allowed to apply as a U0 year, year um, or U0? Sorry about that. Um, so I think, can we elaborate? How do I, like as a student, how do I see if I'm a year zero or year one? And what if I have some advanced standing uh, credits? Can I, can I still apply uh, for some of the SURE projects? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Um, the student to be eligible, you should be a at least a U1 student. However, I encourage you if to go into the project that you're interested in to see what is the requirement that the professor is asking and also to approach the professor. It's, um, it doesn't hurt to approach the professor even let's say um, it's not clear if, if you can apply or not you can reach to the professor and ask them, you know, saying, I'm a U0 student, I've taken these courses, can I apply? But usually what is listed as a requirement in the project that is listed on the website is what the professors are looking for. It kind of goes back to my machine tool lab example of, if they're saying that they want a year three student, it's because most likely you've taken certain courses and have that previous knowledge in order to be able to work in the lab. So if you're a year zero and you want to apply for a year three position, then the likelihood of getting even considered is probably very low. So. Yeah, because as Lori mentioned, some professors are looking for students who have um, taking certain courses. So they have certain experience, I can say, in um, the research project, while other uh, professors might be looking at helping students and, and, and showing them step by step how to go about the, the research project. So that's why it depends on the professor's requirement. Um, then I see that uh, we have another question um, about the SURE program. Do we have to be physically present in Canada or can we participate remotely? I think right now we, we have not decided or we do not, do not know how SURE will like how sure will look like this year. Um, I, our goal is obviously to offer um, the projects in person and also offer the, the press, the, so the, um, offer the, um, the events in person. So I think you should assume um, that you will be asked to be present. Um, however, we, will not, we don't know if we're able to, to offer any of those events in person. Like nobody knows how the situation is going to be, but I think you should assume that you need to be um, in person. Professors though have also been asked to do both so that like right now obviously with the pandemic and all of the um, or the ban on flying and all that kind of stuff and then the curfews that we're going through uh, that most likely right now it's going to be virtual but professors have also been asked that if things change and we are allowed back onto campus that they can somehow change it so that you're not just virtual now but you're also uh, on campus because we don't know I mean you could only possibly be allowed onto campus two days out of five. So they're going to have to kind of everything's going to be a you know on an ongoing basis and a kind of a case by case scenario kind of thing. So it's really unknown at this time. So um, so when there is a definite agreement reached with the professor, um, is um, is that something we should wait for the professor to initiate or something that we should suggest? Like how does a, a definite agreement, how, like how was that reached? Do you want me to answer um, that? Do that, Lori? Yeah. So basically it's you reaching out to the professor saying that, you know, presenting yourself uh, in a nice package and then saying to the professor, I really want to work for you. And if I only, if you accept me only, I will only apply to you. That's how you get your one-to-one -one match, but it has to be you reaching out to the professor, unless you're somebody like Danil who had worked with the prof already and they kind of knew each other. And then sometimes the professor will say, hey, you know, to whoever it might be, that if you do a, a you know, uh, if you apply for sure, I will hire you no matter what. I'm not gonna hire the other students. That's how you get your one-to-one, -one. but most often than not, it's you, the student, reaching out to the professor, asking them to hire only you for that position.
Um, someone is asking how flexible the start and end dates are, for sure. It's, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, the professor and what ex is expected of you is to be present between May and August. So again, if there is any special circumstances that you would like to let the professor know about, you're interested in certain project, we encourage you to communicate with the professor. Um, well, and yeah. see if this is, this is a non McGill student asking that question, though. Yeah. So in this case, I probably would uh, recommend you, Louis. Um, Louis. So since since you are very much outside of the regular uh, sure months, you're talking about July to October. I would recommend you to have a conversation outside of the sure program uh, with one of the professors because maybe they are interested in hiring you for. Uh, just a research project um, in the faculty or in the department. Um, so with these months, you're definitely not able to participate in sure. I mean, it's one thing if let's say, uh, I think the, the Monday is May 3rd. If you, let's say you wanted to start May 7th, that's fine. But once it's past June 1st, it's, it's unfortunately too late. This is a 16 week project. So it would be impossible for you to catch up and it has to be done between May and August. We don't extend past um, our, uh, our August uh, dates just because then for McGill, September to December is our uh, actual uh, school term. And so it wouldn't really uh, be feasible for somebody like uh, yourself. But like Bree said, it doesn't stop the professor from hiring you outside of the SURE program. Um, so I think there's another question about what's the average GPA accepted. I think I also quickly responded to someone else about the GPA requirements. So once you meet the, the minimum GPA requirements uh, of the SURE program, it's up to the professor to discuss with you or to, to determine who will be admitted. And they no longer, uh, I mean, they might look at your GPA, but it's not, it's not a requirement. It's more if you meet the minimum requirements, um, you can apply and a professor can hire you also based on other uh, qualities that you have. Maybe you have some experience, maybe you did really well in one of his courses, maybe you are just, uh, you're very motivated. So um, it, after meeting the minimum requirements, we no longer look, and it, uh, even our office no longer looks at GPA. Maybe a professor does, but, but we're not looking at GPAs anymore. And just quickly, I see a lot of people saying, what's the difference, you know, questioning U3 versus year three, they're the same. U2 yes. is year two. It's just that, Years ago, we were on a different system. So everything was U1, U2, U3. And then we went to a different program on a different system and they changed it to year one, year two, year three. But I can say for those of you who are potentially thinking about this or not sure, you are only a year three, your last two semesters before graduation. So you could be a student here for five years and still be a year two. You'll only be a year three, your last two terms before you graduate. So I hope that kind of clears it up for some people. And look at your unofficial transcript. Your unofficial yeah. transcript will show um, if you're year two or year two, three. Um, so someone is wondering if, I, if we apply for sure this year, but we're not uh, accepted um, and we apply again next year, will that lessen our chances of receiving a position? Not at all, no. Bye, and just a reminder, um, if you, if you want to be considered for the second round that I mentioned in the presentation in March, you have to apply in January. So the, the second round that we usually uh, look and we do in March is going to be only for those who applied in January. However, if you are not accepted and you applied next year, it's not going to um, uh, decrease, let's say, the, your opportunity to get into shore. I'm trying to look. I think we we already a question uh, where I think I've seen a question regarding where uh, where students can find the recording. So we will be posting this recording in the couple in the coming couple of days. So you'll be able to access it via our website. And it'll be on the same place where you got the Zoom link. So how does it work if you apply to uh, multiple projects? Um, so do you choose, uh, let's say you have, you have applied for several projects and the professor is interested in working with all of you, like what, what, what happens? Like what happens if I get selected for several uh, projects? So I can take that one, Diala. Um, 
if let's say you are a lucky student who applies to three different, uh, sorry, three different professors and all three professors want to hire you, we will send you an email asking which of the three professors you would want to work for and then we'll uh, confirm that way. Um, so what's the deadline for Sure International? Is there a deadline for to apply for Sure International? I think it's March 30th. It's usually the whole month of March that you can apply. Yeah, so it's March 1st until March 30th. So but I would say keep checking just because every day something seems to be different when it comes to the pandemic. And so we say March, but maybe something will happen and we'll have to push it back to April. We really, we don't know. So just keep looking at the website. And as soon as we have any kind of information, it'll all be posted there. Uh, and then we have a question about um, the US rate. Uh, like how am I, how can I be eligible for it? And is there a separate application process for so I think as the I, answer, answer if you was answer. ready. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you're going to apply to Shore uh, regardless. And in the application process or the selection of the candidates, we will let you know if you're eligible for NSERC or not. Usually, as I mentioned, to be eligible for a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Uh, but the key uh, component that we would look at is, is your CGPA. Um, however, there's something else also to look at is uh, if you apply to a project and the professor is not uh, a USRA or a, a, an NSERC grant holder, then you won't be eligible for NSERC. So this is that we look at. But if you are selected for NSERC, uh, you'll be contacted and you will be uh, notified. Um, so um, someone is wondering, and so is there a GPA cutoff for the NSERC? It changes every year. It's really hard to say. Uh, I know someone is wondering if uh, we should negotiate the professor contribution before we apply or should we wait until we have a match with the professor? Can you answer that, Lori? Um, sure. Uh, um, I don't know, Lorraine, do you have more experience in, in the negotiation stuff? To me, I would wait until I have the uh, offer from the professor, and then that's when you kind of negotiate your, your salary and your vacations. But Lorraine's a career center advisor, so maybe she has uh, other thoughts on that. I think, I think in terms, okay, well, typically when folks are negotiating, they don't often negotiate their internship salaries, okay? Usually it's like full-time salaries. In terms of research for sure, I don't know how necessarily appropriate it would be to, to go out and negotiate this, this extra stipend before even having it offered to you, having the job offered to you. It's something you can inquire about. I think it's worth asking if the prof uh, does have any research money to top you up. So I think it, it's the way in which you approach the professor. I wouldn't go in there and say, I'd love to work with you but I'm only going to do it for an extra $3,000. It's, it's not the way to, to go about it. So it's once you're having those conversations, um, ask, ask if, if there's additional funding, but don't, you know, demand it just yet. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes uh, uh, the, the research experience is, is invaluable in itself. I know that's a bit cheesy, but you don't want to pass up that opportunity just because it didn't, you didn't get the extra two or three thousand dollars. I hope that kind I of think also too, you kind of have to think that this is something that you're passionate about. You want to either go into grad school, you want to become a teacher later on down the road. Uh, so this is something that's kind of important. And so uh, it it's truly something that you have to want to do because obviously you're going to, you will, unfortunately, the, the salary is not going to be comparable to, or I should say the stipend will not be comparable to what you potentially could have gotten in industry. Uh, so you have to have really a, a passion for research or as mentioned, if the path that you want to go down is to master's, PhD, or teaching, then take a look and see what it's like that first year, and then uh, potentially ask for more money the next time around. But uh, like Lorraine says, it might come off as, as bad that I only will work for you if you pay me this much money. Uh, so maybe <laughs> smooth it out a little bit, and then potentially only once you get hired, then do your negotiations. Next question. I think they were kind of 
done with. So someone is asking me about, I think someone is asking, telling me about that he's a little late. I would recommend, um, uh, how do we contact professors? I would recommend you to look on our website. I think the process is very clearly explained on how to apply, what the requirements are. And I think you can also find a presentation. You will be able to find a presentation online. Um, so someone so is once asking, everything is done, sorry, just, um, I don't know if it was 100% mentioned in the, in the presentation, uh, but when, now you're applying to the professor. Then once the deadline has finished uh, and all the dates are on our website, uh, so you can go check them out. Uh, once that's happened, then the professors are the, going to be reviewing your applications and then they have a deadline as well uh, to send us their decisions. And then we in turn will review and then send out the decisions the week of February 22nd. So it will come from us by email. Uh, we will only email those students who got an award. And so sure students, you'll get one memo, students that receive the NSERC USRA will get a second memo because you will then have to actually go onto the NSERC website and fill in the NSERC paperwork. And all the instructions will be in the letter. So it's, it's, it takes a little while for everything to, because you have to apply, process to make their decisions. And then uh, it's one thing if they're one-to-one -one matches, then that goes quickly. But if professors are nominating students and they can nominate up to three students per project, that takes a little bit of time. So it'll take Diala and I, but you know, a few days to go through it and then, you know, send out the, the decisions. Okay, I think, are there any more last questions? Someone is asking if you can email multiple professors prior to application. And I think you well, should also, I mean, you only have three applications, so you may want to speak with the professors first, then once you get back, hear back from them, sorry, then actually go onto the website and put in your application. Because if you've reached out to six profs and you've already filled in the application, you won't be able to. It, it, it stops you at three. Do you have any questions for Danil as a student who, uh, so he can uh, take off if he needs to? No? Quite proud for that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can just add about like reaching out to professors from, from a student perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I would just say definitely reach out to, to several professors. Again, as I kind of mentioned in, in my um, small talk, uh, I think it's really important to actually understand what the project's going to be about to make sure that, you know, you are a good fit for it, but also that the project is a good fit for you. Um, I think that's really what a lot of profs are, are kind of looking for. And also, you know, some profs will look for upper year students for certain projects. Um, whereas others will look for, you know, lower year students or also cross disciplinary students. So I know some, again, like my experience in, in an electrical engineering lab was, I think, partially because they were looking for someone who had mechanical engineering experience because I would like design a little casing or, or something like that. So sometimes profs are actually looking to, you know, for students who have experience in, in different faculties. Um, but again, the only way to really find that out is just email the prof, like set up a time to talk. Um, they may not get back to you. And I, I think profs a lot of times don't get back to you, but um, yeah, don't let that discourage you. I think there's a lot of different projects to apply for, so. And also it is a busy time of year. It's the first yeah. weeks of school. So it may take longer for a prof to, to respond. And typically it, it could be three to five working days. Uh, so it just really depends on how busy they are. Uh, and they're trying to settle into a, you know, a virtual community yet again. And so <laughs> it might take a slightly longer than a uh, usual time frame. So, yeah. so be patient. But um, if you don't hear, I would say like, let's say four or five days have passed, then reach out. Um, but ideally you reach out to them first, get the agreement and then go on and fill in the application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will also say, I think a lot of profs are pretty happy to kind of settle with you before the application deadline, because again, it's less, well, less, kind of a, of a headache for them as well. So I think it's quite common that profs will, you know, go through their round of selections and then let you know, hey, I think I'm just gonna like put down your name. Like, are you okay with that? Um, so I think that's, at least in my experience, pretty common situation. I noticed somebody says, what's a competitive CGPA? 
I, I'm not really quite sure in what context you mean. Is it for NCERQSRA or just in general? I think as long as you have a, the cutoff for NCERQSRA or just SURE in itself is 3.0, but you don't necessarily have to have a 4.0 to get hired. Some professors are not looking for that. They want to know what, other, you know, you could be a 3.01, but have done tons of research, have worked in industry, and they want to hire you versus a student who has a 4.0 and no experience whatsoever. Um, if you're asking what the competitiveness is for uh, cutoffs for NSERC USRA, it really varies from year to year. It depends on how many Canadian permanent, because you have to be Canadian permanent resident. So it depends on how many students on our applications have that, uh, how many positions we get from NSERC. So that's why we can't just say, oh, it's above this point, you know, this GPA, you'll get it no matter what we can, because it's fluctuating depending on the students. And secondly, the number of positions that we get from NSERC. There's also a question, can I apply for projects from other majors? Yes, of course. So the Again, projects are experience. posted by department, but you can apply to uh, projects from any other major. Well, actually, if you look at the electrical engineering, there are two projects where the professor uh, from mechanical is looking for both mechanical and electrical engineers. So it doesn't stop you. Like Danil, he was a perfect example. He's in one major, but worked with a prof in another uh, discipline. Uh, so it really just depends on what the project is, what they're looking for, and what your experience is. So it, it doesn't hurt. It's it's free program. You don't have to pay per application. So whoever, like whatever project looks great to you, send out your appeal and keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best. Um, and uh, that's all we can suggest is that if that that some if it's a project that really appeals to you, then go for it. And even still, I mean, we have students who don't necessarily um, apply to projects in engineering, they're applying to ones in science. So you can kind of go wherever you want. Uh, so someone is wondering if you need to let the professor know that you're an international student. Well, I would, I would normally say it doesn't really matter because you would be here on campus during that time frame. but because again, it's a pandemic uh, and we don't know what's gonna happen, uh, they may want to know, uh, the problem is that we just don't know what's going to happen in the year 2021 uh, with this. And so um, they, you know, if let's say we're suddenly allowed on campus, but you're not in Canada, are you able to fly? Are they okay with you remaining and continuing to do your research in whatever country you are? So yes, I would let them know that if you are not here, that that's your situation. And so that way they're not surprised if let's say everything is lifted come June and they expect you in the lab June 15th and you write to them and say, well, no, I'm in, I don't know, I'm in Lebanon or something. Uh, so <laughs> uh, be upfront with them as much as you possibly can. Um, so someone is wondering, so maybe Daniel, you can respond to this question. So if I'm emailing the professor, will I tell him about my, do, do I submit my resume? Will I tell him about my ex experience or like, how do you, how did you apply for, like, how did you contact the professor? Yeah, so I kind of, I posted a little thing in the chat, but I can say mm -hmm. it as well. Um, I would definitely email them your CV off the bat. I think the first, the first question any prof will likely ask you if you don't include your CV is, hey, can I see your CV? So you can definitely save yourself that extra email interaction. Um, uh, they'll also, they might ask you for, for your unofficial transcript as well. So I would send, you know, it doesn't hurt to send that as well. Um, I would say again, in my experience, most of the time profs care a lot more about your extracurriculars and your kind of tactical experience or just what you've learned, any projects you've done, if you've done an internship or, or other research. Um, I think they care a lot more about that than your GPA. Um, at least again, in my experience, some profs are obviously different, but um, yeah, I think so long as you can kind of, you know, sell why you are applicable for, for the given position. Um, and that can be even just pure interest, I think. You can just express, hey, you know, this is really what I want to focus on. You know, I might want to do graduate studies in this exact field. I don't have a lot of current experience, but, you know, I'm really passionate. And like, here's other things which show that I'm willing to work hard and like commit to a project. Um, I think that's, you know, also a very good sell for, for profs. So definitely include your extracurriculars. Yeah, I think that's a little bit about what we talked about before, that as long as you meet the minimum requirements, mm -hmm. after that, um, it's, it's yeah. up to the professor what he finds important uh, in the student uh, and whether or not he will hire you. It's, it's more based on other aspects of, um, 
of you not to, to deviate. And I would add everything into the first email. That way, because professors are, as we already said, pretty busy, uh, they're probably getting, you know, quite a few emails. And so to have to do an additional back and forth uh, will cause probably some delays. So I would just, whatever you think uh, is important, uh, I would attach to the email and fire it off that way. Um, I did notice something about, again, the years. So year zero is typically students who come from outside of Quebec who did not do a SAGENT program. And so they have to make up the freshman courses of science, physics, and math. So if you're in that situation, you can try to apply with the professor, but again, a lot of them want to know or want to see that you've actually started your core courses, which would mean year one or higher. But again, it's free. It doesn't hurt to ask uh, because even though let's say you're year one, maybe you were, you know, doing something before that gives you the experience that they're looking for, even though you're technically at McGill a year zero student. So. Okay, I think. Are there any more questions? Looks like the, the questions dying down a little bit. So, so I think that uh, if there are any more additional questions, feel free also to use the sure um, email. Um, we will be able to respond to any of your questions there as well. I think that's thank it. you. Thank you very yeah. much all for attending. Um, and good luck to all of you. All right. Have a good day, everybody.